Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Nurturing Our Roots, the live talk show. Uh, we're here every Tuesday night, and we are happy that you'll be joining us. We're going to have a very outstanding show tonight. I am so happy to listen to all the research that these dynamic researchers have uh, is going to share with all of us. It's just a learning opportunity, and we want to thank you. We're here every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time, and we want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, hi, my co-host, Karen. How are you? Hi, Antoinette. I'm so happy to be back. <laughs> it's happy. I'm happy to have you back. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Karen. Okay. And I will um, go on and uh, share my screen. And as I welcome our guests, Daniel Williams and Brian Sheffy, who are a team, and also Connie Green. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Oh. Well, we're, we're, we're absolutely uh, happy to have uh, your team, as well as you, Connie, on tonight. Um, we're going to have some uh, amazing uh, family history uh, to share some amazing family stories. And um, well, we're going to start off with uh, Brian and Danya. Brian Sheffy is the founder and host of the popular online genealogy website and program, Genealogy Adventures. Genealogy Adventures provides a mix of genealogy research strategies for people with a multi-ethnic family history with a particular emphasis on researching enslaved families. The show co-presented with genealogist and author Danya Wilson, uh, Williams, give you a whole new last name, Danya, uh, uh, also covers various aspects of African-American history. Danya and Brian um, and a small group of dedicated researchers have found 27 of Moses's, Moses Williams's 45 enslaved children uh, researching, researching their descendants to living people. Brian and Danya will discuss the repositories, records, and documents they use to uncover what is known about Moses's life to date. And so uh, welcome um, Danya and um, Brian. And then next, uh, um, later, we will also um, have uh, uh, Connie uh, share her family inf information. And Connie Green traced her family history to East Feliciana, Louisiana, and Mississippi. After researching her mother's family history, her family asked her to be the family historian. She hit a brick wall and would like to discuss that brick wall with uh, both Antoinette and I. And so uh, welcome, Connie. Uh, you are on mute, Connie. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. And so uh, Brian and Danya, um, what got you guys into researching Moses Williams? How did this get uh, kicked off? I'm just going to blame me. I'm going to let Danya start, but it's going to me. Yeah, I'm gonna blame. I'm gonna blame him. I'm gonna blame him because basically, um, I already knew that I had a great, great grandfather by the name of Moses Williams, and um, his um, he is actually my mother's mother's my mother's mother's grandfather. So we already knew he existed. There was a Moses Williams that it already existed. So I was going through the newspaper one day and, and I came across this particular man and it was Moses Williams. And I was looking and I'm like, that's, that's a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. And I, this man, and I'm looking at this, art, this newspaper article and they said he had, he was four, he had 45 children and he was, what, 65 years old and he looked 50. And I was like, wait a minute, what in the world is going on? I'm, no, and I just looked at Brian and I shared it with him. And I'm like, this, this is not, this is, I'm not researching all of these kids. And he, he said, okay, well, he just didn't say anything. And then he turned around and he found the obituary because he actually lived to be 115 years old. And when we looked, he looked at the obituary and he gave me the date, he sold me the obituary and it said 115. And I'm like, 
that's not, that's not our Moses because our Moses was born in 1791. This man was born in 1769. That's not the right one. He said, yeah, that's his father. I said, Brian, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and, and, and I was done. And I said, I'm not, I'm not doing that. He said, yeah, 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 you are. And sure enough, he made me do it. So I, I blame Brian. <laughs> I think this is this is a good time to actually show everyone one of the articles that kind of got us started on this. It is the article that got us started. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I grabbed the wrong one. <clears throat> so this one actually appeared in a Raleigh, North Carolina newspaper. Um, Moses' death was actually covered even in Kansas um, yeah. because he was so old when he when he died. So this was it. This is dated 1884. Moses Williams colored, aged 115, and Donnie and I would like to emphasize, it's not that he didn't know how old he was. He was really 115. Yeah. Died in Barnwell, South Carolina yesterday. He was the father of 43, but actually 45 children, all of whom are living. They didn't count the two. They didn't count the two that had already died by 1884. Right. The original one appeared in the Charleston Courier, and then we found, oops, oops, have I frozen? No. Oh, sorry. Then we found this. So this is dated 1901. Forgive the language, it's 1901. So whatever, what, what I'm about to read is the language of the day. So this is called The Anomalies and Curiosities of Medicine. It's a medical journal. So they're talking about the fecundity of both the Irish and African-Americans, the myth that we were the only ones having huge families. So the following is a report from Raleigh, North Carolina, gives the date um, to the New York Evening Post. So the fecundity of the Negro race had, um, has been the subject of much comment and discussion. A case has come to light in this state that is one of the most remarkable on record. Moses Williams, a Negro farmer, lives in the eastern section of this state. He is 65 years old, as nearly as he can make out, but does not appear to be over 50. So he was, he did not look his age. Mm -hmm. He has been married twice and by two wives has born 45 children. By the first wife, he had 23 children, 20, 20 of whom were girls and three were boys. By the second wife, he had 22 children, 20 girls, and two boys. Look at that. He also has about 50 grandchildren. The case is well authenticated. So that's, the, that's what I saw first. And then Brian found the obit. So can the I, thing about him. Can I just say something? The 20 by both wives is just something in his genes that they wanted to study because both wives, 20 girls mm. and three, boy, he had a lot of children. I, I'm wondering if they even counted all the grandchildren. <laughs> no. You want to tell them? Right? <laughs> tell them. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that as you guys stated, we have about, we found about 27 out of the 45 kids so far. And out of those, and for each one of those 27 children, they have 10 or more children. Mm -hmm. So as of right now, we're looking at an average, we're looking at at least 270 grandchildren. That's, and that's, you know, we, he's looking at look, having no less than 450 grand. Now, mind you, my great grandmother is, would be one of his, would, would Lulu would be a great grandchild of his or a grandchild? Great grandchild. She's a great grandchild. Well, she's one of 16. So because she's a great grandchild and one of 16, they were still having large numbers of children. And my Africa, mother is one of 14. Mm. <laughs> so and, they were still having them. And my mother's mother, who would also be one of Moses Williams' great grandchildren, was one of 13. And all of her family were having double digit kids. Yeah, they There's were just constantly having double digit kids. Freedom. So, Gosh. We, we estimate him to be probably 
the father of two thirds of Edgefield. And a good part of Barnwell. Yeah, and a good part of Barnwell. So because he was having, and he would, he's documented now as having children. I think the last confirmed one that we found, he was in his 80s. Yeah. What? Her. In his 80s. As an 80 year old man, He's having children when his children are having children, mm. and he's having children when his grandchildren are right. having children. Williams is a nightmare name because it's such a common name. There's five distinctly di genetically different enslaving Williams families in both Edgefield and, and Barnwell. There, thankfully, there's a very thorough Y DNA study that's been done, and it's been proven that there's just five different unrelated families, they didn't even marry each other. So that's that was the first challenge for us, was trying to figure out who is, first of all, we're looking at a name William for either a mulatto or a black person in the 1870 census, is that his kid? Or does right. it belong to one of the other Williams family? Is it a grandchild? Who, you know, who is this person to him? Right. And that's still something that we, you know, that we still have to factor in. And we, you know, we get excited every time we see a new Williams in, a, in Barnwell or Edgefield. They that, get excited. We get excited, yes. They get, they, they get excited. <laughs> I, I catch an attitude. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, but we, we have, still do it. I mean, but I catch an attitude. Okay, so we take let's that. Hear from Connie a little bit, and we're going to come back. Connie, what's yeah. your family story? Is something that you've been wanting to share with us, uh, give us your niche. Well, um, my mom's first cousin, he, he used to get on the Greyhound all the time when he retired and he would go back to Mississippi. Every summer, I spent the summers in Mississippi. But when I got older and I talked to him, he was saying, I'm going to find our family. So it's like, oh, where's our family at? So, uh, Cleveland, Mississippi. Okay. So. He would say, I, I want to go find our family. I said, where's the family at? He said, they're all over the place. So getting with him, and then he said, I'm going to Durant. I'm going to Kosciuszko. Only time I ever heard of Kosciuszko is when Oprah mentioned Kosciuszko. So I never knew there was a, such a place. So um, when he got sick, I told him, I want to learn to do what you're doing. So that was back in 2006 or something when I started. And just to be able to go see Kosciuszko, I was scared of that place. I really was. And to, to wind around on those little winding roads to get back there, I told my mom, I said, when it's light, we're leaving. We are not leaving in the dark. Because I, I, the signs, then you see Trump country up there. You see no trespass, you will be shot. And you actually still saw little slave cabins in some of those woods out there. So I, I, I got head on into it from there and just finding what I found out recently, it broke my heart. Wow, what did you find out? <clears throat> my third great grandfather, his name was Alex Little. Um, he borrowed money from his slave owner and he wasn't, he, he, he had to be born free, I, I'm guessing. I don't know for sure because there's no birth record. This is what we run into in Mississippi all the time. There is no birth record. They did not start documenting these people until 1912. Yes. So <clears throat> me finding this particular record, the lady in the Tyler County at the library, Ms. Bidlow, she says, somebody found something and wants you to have it. So that's when I got that form showing that he borrowed money. How in 1885 does a, well, first he was listed as white in 1870. Then 1880, he was listed as mulatto. Then 1900, he was listed as Negro. Mm -hmm. So in 1885, how would you give him and another white man $150 in that time? That was unheard of to me. And he had to barter his crop, his whatever he was growing, his cotton, his corn, everything at that time. And I'm like, well, what happened? Well, then I also find out there was a white side of Littles. There was a black side of Littles. So the white Little that was having children with the black Little, they told him, you have to leave those people alone, disown them. He said, no, I'm not disowning my black children. So we spread from there. 
<clears throat> wow. Ooh. Yeah. It's it this uh, your each of you your research is so it's so important and so valid because when I think about forty three children, you know, forty five children, and like you said, most of the people there's they are related. And somewhere down the line, how do you choose a wife or a husband in a small community? Was both wives in the same community? Are you talking about Moses? Yes. Brian, you're, you're muted. <laughs> there we go. It looks as though they were both enslaved by the shepherd family. Right. In the same area. In the same area. Yeah, in the same area. Um, one went one way though. We, we we're looking at it in the stalwart. She ended up. She was the second wife. Is what we're is what is, is turning out to be. And um, so we're finding more of the first wife's children. In my yeah, we we actually have a little more of the first wife's children than we do of the second. But we know who she is. We actually know who the first, the, the second wife is. We, we have her full name. Her name is Maria Stallworth. So we're still trying to find the first wife. But we know that the first wife is biologically um, a Haygood from, yeah. from Edgefield. So we always just, I refer to her as Miss Haygood. Yeah. Now what's amazing, what, what's really amazing about this particular situation is that my mom, is a descendant of both of the wives. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Let that sink in. <laughs> explain that. Explain that, please. <laughs> well, because of the women, she because he had so many girls, he has daughters all over Edgefield. And because he has daughters all over Edgefield, my mom is descending from daughters on both sides from both women. And that's why she's a descendant of both women. And that's why Donnie yeah. and I were related eight or nine different ways in South Carolina. And yep. we're gonna be related even more once we get out of there. Yeah. And my, my mother's grandparents were second cousins and they were both Moses's grandchildren. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's not surprising living in a small town no, that be happening because there's so many children. And Connie, whenever you're ready for any of uh, the photographs and the documents that you want to share, just call up on me when you're talking. Okay. To, uh, share it with you. Share it for you. I, I have a question for them because in my family, two sisters married two brothers, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of twins in our family. So we we are always told when we go back to Cleveland or wherever, don't talk to somebody. That's your cousin. Don't talk to. <laughs> you might be you might be bringing your cousin home to meet your family, and they uh -huh. already know that you're a cousin. They have to tell you your cousin's fool, your cousins, and that's because people were separated so much uh -huh. uh, when they left Kosciuszko and Durant, and they migrated north. Well, it took some time for the other ones to start coming north, and then when they got there you forgot what they looked like or you you like it, it was one incidence where somebody was sold as a slave and when they got back to their kids two of their kids had actually got together they didn't know they were related so connie did you did you have to research in a little small community called zamba i have not been there um i don't know what it is there there, it. there's a place called Sarkanochi or something like that. And I'm like, where is that at? <laughs> Cause it's, it's showing that um, my third great grandmother was actually born there and that her father was trying to register her as an Indian. And that shocked me too, that we, we had no idea until recent, very recent. Mm. So, so Brian, all this research that you have done to find out family members of uh, related eight, nine times over. Have you been to that area to conduct any oral histories with 
some of the elderly people that live in the community? I haven't. I was meant to go right before COVID started, so that mm -hmm. think about on that. But I am in touch with cousins who still live there, and I've been there. And they go to all the churches, and they, you know, they, they speak to the older kind of congregation members. But Donnie has been many times. Okay. So been, and the thing is, they didn't know anything about Moses. Um, when I went there, they didn't even realize that they were all related. Oh, really? Yeah. They they actually had no clue. So did they know about the other wife and her and the twenty three children? They didn't, they didn't know. know about Moses. They didn't know anything. No one knew anything about Moses. Well, that explained why they was marrying each other, each other because they had no idea. Yeah, that Moses had another family. Oh my goodness! Yeah. What a book. yeah! It was it was it was um, I mean, even before Moses, Brian and I. I mean, the reason that what brought Brian and I together was endogamy in itself. So we, you know, because of the Peterson line and the Peterson line kicks right into to Moses Williams mm -hmm. and um we it, that whole thing just pushed us together anyway so that particular family in itself they did not know that they were related you had people looking at me like what we're related to each other I, I didn't know he's my cousin I didn't know that was my cousin and it was it was that kind of stuff that really kind of made us get to the point where it was like okay we need to do a whole family just like find everybody. Y'all need a big reunion. Yeah. Okay, who's writing a book? Is there anybody that have a book in mind? Connie, Brian, Daya, anybody? I did it already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's there. Yeah. How can we order that book? <laughs> it's on Amazon. <laughs> It's, it's on Amazon.com. This is my me finding out about everybody. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, if you see all the names on it. Yes. Those are, on this particular book, this is 200 surnames. And mm -hmm. every last one of these surnames connect to my mother. Isn't that something? So, so that you and Brian sort of collaborate on the book, or Brian, you have your own book in mind. I haven't written a family history book, but I have written um, a how to do genealogy book. Okay. Hmm. Okay. No, I, I've, I've only done an ancestor banner and that banner was oh, so long and it's showing each generation of children. I had to stop it at my generation, which would have been the seventh generation because putting pictures on that and showing everybody just how you're actually related. That's what everybody can understand better to me. And with that banner, my mom, she's, she's serious about finishing it out. So that's why she goes looking with me. I think I might've sent a picture with a lady walking in the archive building. Um, she, she's, she's gung ho. She goes in cemeteries with me. She goes uh -huh. on that road with me. I don't know if I sent you that or not, but she wants to finish that before she leaves here. And that's and her she's making a priority. Let yes. me just, I just want to, um, hold on. I just want to share. Who is this beautiful woman here? Could you tell me? Could you tell they, us? They said this was Winnie, which would have been Alex, um, Alex mother, Alex wife. Winnie and Alex would have been husband and wife. I don't know what's mm -hmm. trying to pop up on my screen. But and how she, did you get all um, those pictures? All the pictures you sent me, how did you get those? One of my relatives, his name is Carlos Drain. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, he passed away in January. He had, um, he done a DNA test and he reached out to me through this DNA test. And I sent you his picture because his father, his mother, um, it says Rudolph Drain on there. Well, they were, they were of the mixed race. And I can see that. He, he had those pictures and he didn't know who they were. So his wife is Tracy and she says, can you go on Carlos page and see if you recognize that's Rudolph, if you recognize who this is. So um, 
he he had the pictures and I showed them to my mom and my mom was like, oh, this one's Aunt Annie Mag. And we already had a picture of Winnie because everybody had a picture of Winnie. We just don't have a picture of Alex. So Winnie has um, six kids, seven kids or something like that. She actually had, they said 15. I have not been able to find 15. Mm -hmm. I've been able to find 11. Okay. And Winnie was the one who had Maddie. Maddie had Ether. Ether had Rudolph. Rudolph had Carlos. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, a thing with this guy. I want to tell you guys what happened with him. Um, he, he had to go back to Durant to his mother's funeral. He was with um, some more of the family members. And they actually told him here in Chicago, you cannot ride in that Negro car. You cannot get in that nigga car or else this train isn't moving. And he kept telling them, this is my family. And they wasn't trying to hear that from him. And they, they, they hell bent on not letting him go to his own mother's funeral because he looked so white. And my, my mother's aunt, her kids would even mess with him a little bit and say, hey, the white boy coming back. The white boy is coming back. But they knew he was their first cousin. So third cousin, second cousin. They knew, and it, it hurt his heart with the things he had to go through as a, a mixed man being classified as white and he was mixed. And he was mixed. He was, he was really wow. done bad about going to uh, his own mother's funeral. Wow. wow. I have a question about the drains. Mm -hmm. uh, did they come from anywhere down south? Yes, they did. Yes, Where they did. They are from the ranch and someplace else further. I have Tracy. She's following us on the live chat. So she may be able to answer that question too. Cause some of them were um, somewhere in Louisiana that I noticed there were a few further South and other places. So the reason yeah. I ask is I actually descend from some drains um, that come from Mississippi oh and my God. also migrate, uh, migrated to Tennessee. Wow. And so um, uh, they were from uh, Madison wow. County, Mississippi. Uh, that's a big possibility. If you ever get a chance, I can send you my JetCon file to go on mm -hmm. onto my uh, Ancestry page and look at all the drains that I have on there so far. And I'm still trying to find some more of them. Okay. You know, I, I want to go back to Brian and uh, Donya for a minute. Then, and I have a question for them too, Antoinette, but go ahead. <laughs> there needs to be a documentary produced on this story because um, I know a man in Fluka, Louisiana, who had 22 children. Mm. Uh, he, well, he said his grandfather was a stud. And so a lot of the men, a lot of the children he made in the community, he didn't even know that they, they you know, they was marrying each other. And sometimes when sisters and brothers come together, be intimate with each other, it creates this type of slow gene, you know, it, it, because that's a forbidden relationship. But they would not know, they didn't know because he said that his grandfather was used as a stud. So he, had, he didn't keep any track of all the girls that he uh, got pregnant because it, he was just used for that stud. And so he said, almost everybody in this community is related. Hmm. So that would be great if you all can really look at trying to solicit someone that can write a grant that can help you all get a documentary done. Since you have the book, it's already published. And, and that collaboration between you and Brian is so very important. I don't it's know if the people who have the money to do it would find it a value in that. I agree. I mean, I think it's a wonderful story. I mean, just, just to encapsulate his life, and I, I know Dong is going to add to this. Moses was born in 1769. So he was born before the revolution. So he, was, he would have remembered the revolution, the War of 1812, in the Civil War. Mexican War. The Mexican War as well. Thank you. Several. So much. 
Yeah. So he saw everything, you know, and he was in the thick of it in the Revolutionary War. I mean, there's all these deeds that his father and slaver created as he's moving his people back and forth from South Carolina to North Carolina. So he was seeing all of that. Think about just in 115 years, how much his world changed. Yeah. It was, it was such a radical change. And I just wanted to make it clear, and I'm sure again, Dong is going to jump in. Moses knew who all of his kids were. Mm. relationship with all of them and um, Ron, you know uh someone we, just because it, we're talking about it you put it out there enough you know you put it out there enough uh june team is coming up you know keep your story out there and tell the story like you're doing now somebody will hear it well here's the thing we actually started a um a dna project but it kind of got stalled when the um, there was an issue that we we joined with Howard University at one point, and we named it after I think Karen knew Sheila, knew Sheila Hightower Allen. She had passed, um, but we named it after her, and it's still going to go on. But first, there was some issues at Howard, and then the young lady graduated. She's now has her own business to do this, but we're still in the process of trying to actually do what you're talking about. Maybe not the, the documentary part. Hopefully we'll, we will be able to get that done, the documentary part, but we're really trying to focus on um, finding his children and, the, and, and really digging into all of his kids. Because we know that DNA is going to make a big deal. It's going to it's going to make a huge impact as far as really finding all of his children. Um, because by eighteen seventy, they were married, so right. none, none of them are carrying the Williams' last name. Right. The girls are more difficult to find than anything, and um, it's 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 a lot to take in. But again, like Brian said because he knew his children, they knew each other. They knew they were siblings. So I don't think we actually have that particular problem of them marrying each other. But that doesn't mean that that didn't happen in other families within our family. Well, in that generation, but the further the generation is removed, mm. second, third, fourth cousins. Right. Yeah, because, Almost definitely. Because oh. I'm looking at it right now. I knew all of my first cousins mm -hmm. on my mom's side. I didn't know anyone on my father's side, but on my mom's side, I did. And now my first cousins, they have grandchildren. I have grandchildren. And the grandchildren don't even know, a lot of them don't even know each other because we don't get together at family gatherings like we used to, you know, coming to Big Mama's house on a Sunday. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, mm -hmm. get everybody together. So... It's nothing for one of my grandkids to meet one of my first cousin's grandkids and they can grow up and, and, and not even know unless, well, especially when you're talking about that second and third generation removed. And well, I mean, the stuff that you're saying right now, that we can, we can go, we can be, um, fast forward to at this particular moment. My mom is the baby of 14. My daughter is considered, so because my mom is the baby of 14, I'm the youngest grandchild. My daughter is considered a second cousin. She went to school with a third cousin and didn't even know that she was in school with her third cousin. Yeah. Same thing happened with my son. He went to school with someone, didn't even know. They had, they bumped heads. They bumped heads. They didn't even like each other. Right. That's the same thing with Karen and Karen and I had no clue. No. Exactly. They had no idea. So, I mean, these are things that are going on right in the, in the now. Forget in about now. back in, in the now. back then. These things are going on in the now. And and because we don't do the 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 the, the family reunions like we used to, or even worse, oh, we sorry. only join each other. That's it. Right. We don't include the rest of the people. Mm -hmm. So that's where the calling all branches, we have something called calling all branches. That's and that's 
all of our families, all of the people that we found in all of our trees. We All of those 200 surnames that you see on this book and how many that we found so far. Now what, we're like over 300 surnames now? Mm -hmm. We have like over 300 surnames. We, we try to have a reunion every two years. COVID messed it up. We did it in 2016. <laughs> we did it again in 2018. But then it was time to do it in 2020. COVID messed that up. But we hope to get back into it and just pull all of them. And not only the Black people. We want the white folks, too, because we know you exist. We know that you're a part of us. You know what never seems to amaze me is that this this coming Sunday, well, next really was going to be in June, July. The Harrells was playing a family reunion. And due to COVID, we had to cancel that reunion. I just want to say, I hear more and more people in the family say, if it's not their sister or brother family, the other branches doesn't exist. Yes. That is, I can't comprehend that because mm -hmm. when we think about our families back in the 60s and the 50s, they visit each other. You know, you didn't know if a person, a third cousin was a first or second, all of a sudden, this is your cousin. And that was it. They didn't break down the lineage. But somehow we got to get back to that. And we're getting more and more removed from it every day. And I'll give you a good reason for doing that. Some of my most prized favorite photographs, specifically coming from Edgefield, came from cousins that I've met online or I've spoken to on the phone, but I've never met them in person, but they've shared photographs of three times great grandparents, two times great grandparents, yeah. that no one on my side of the family has ever seen. Wow. You know, I, I ran into this problem too with the, I had to tell people just because you married and changed your last name, you did not change your family. Ooh. You mm. still are family. The last name was the only thing that changed and you can't separate someone because they have a different last name um right now the louisiana connection i have which i was i was going to talk to you about they are holmes and lewis's but further down the line it changes to a mayhall or a hodges or something like that and the the first thing out their mouth how, that's not my cousin we don't have the same no that's not true that's not, not true tom holmes married charlotte lewis that's the only way her name got changed and all these other kids yeah they married someone else but you don't change them because they changed their last name they are still your family and you cannot separate them and leave them out i tell them you can't have a one-sided reunion with just one branch of people you have have to invite everybody and me doing this research they say why do you want this person on there because that person married into the family and if you look back if you look back i have the duns which married into the lewises or the lewises married into the duns and because they didn't know they were that another cousin or somebody an aunt had married a dun they think that that's not their family. That's not true. My that's husband's true. mother is a is a dun. Oh my god! <laughs> not actually done. because there was a dun that lived on. There was a Harrell that lived on the street uh, on one of the census right above my dun family and my Lewis family. So it's like, oh my god, could it be? I don't know. <laughs> Are you saying gun or done? G U N N or D U N N? D, D is in dog, D-U-N-N. -N. My cousin is a dun. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I got a cousin who's a dun, I do. Wow, you oh, see? But, you know, that's well, why- Are so there questions coming from a chat? Yes, yes, actually this one might be good for Brian. It says, how can you, since you wrote the book on genealogy research, how can you find your ancestors and their family who were sold in a slave auction? Huh? Mm. Um, you would need, well, I'm doing that now, researching the weeping time people. You, if it's a sale, there's um, a ledger. Because basically, you know, human beings were sold. 
Basically, and people didn't, they didn't pay the full amount up front most of the time because they didn't know how much they were going to be spending. It was half up front and then they would work out terms. So someone had to keep track of who was buying the enslaved people, how much they owed, where they lived. So you need to do research on the auctioner. Do their ledgers ledger still exist? If they exist, where are they? You need to research the person who, you know, their last enslaver before they were, before they were sold. They may have family papers in an archive. Um, when it comes to this, kind of, when it comes to this kind of research, I think people think about it that it's more complicated than it really is. It was a business. Businesses, and especially businesses back then, were not complicated businesses. It's all money, ledgers, accounts, books, deeds. You can find the deeds, the sales receipts, and the, and the ledgers. That that's the way to go. And Brian, also too, they can also look at some universities that's in that area because sometimes families donate their loved ones papers to the university as well as the state at the state archives that is so correct Antoinette do by chance you have a black and white form I sent it was actually the slave sale for my great grandmother sharp third great grandmother I that up while yeah. care for the next question in okay <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, I, and I'm just going to run through some of the comments, actually, um, uh, uh, from uh, the, the chat. Uh, uh, Nikita says, not sure if he may be an ancestor of mine, <laughs> as my maiden name is Williams. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I guess that goes with the challenge of uh, researching Williamses. Um, and then um, she says, I have family on my father's side that are Williams's, I have uh, hit a, a roadblock doing research. And, and maybe perhaps if you guys have any tricks about uh, researching common surnames, and when, especially when they're common in a particular location, uh, is there any, uh, I guess with them having so many girls, this, the Williams surname may not have been an issue. Well, I was gonna backtrack and say there are you would have to look at the male Y and D, if there's a male Y DNA study. And like I said, blessedly for the Williams, there is, there, there is one. And I think there are thousands of them up there now. And basically throughout the South, mm -hmm. um, you get a male in your line, a male in your line to test. And again, it has to be male to male for the Y DNA test. There cannot be any women in that line. It's father to son, to son, to son, to son. Mm -hmm. Get the men in your family to test and then compare their, their haplogroup, which is like a little fingerprint stamp. Um, go to the Y-DNA project and see where, where that haplogroup falls. And then uh, Drain T says, the drains came from Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, that group. Uh, and I, I was, uh, my drains, they actually came from a Prince George's County, Maryland, moved into Georgia, then they moved into Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And Antoinette, it, it's, it was Wesley Nolan who was married to a drain. Oh, really? Yes, he, he was married to Francis Drain. Yes, okay, so that explains it. Okay, Connie, I did find this record. Is this the one that you're talking about right here? Oh, no, that's the grave records of me trying to find people that were buried buried and where they might have been buried and how much <laughs> okay this, this is something else too because if you don't have a record of where they were buried at or how much this is how they wrote some things up i wish i can pull that up for you um i, I, I have a master i do have yet. a picture that i want to ask you about um let me just stop sharing this here's another one i i want to actually about this particular photograph. Who is this? This is a school record. Believe it or not, Mississippi did uh, school records for the children. And they think that my grandmother is in this picture. Mm -hmm. My grandmother on my father's side. This was Pace School, Pace, Mississippi in 1929. I, I do that. know that my cousin's my mother's cousin, her father is in here. He's the bow-legged guy on the front, right up in there. <laughs> He's the little front in the front. So that's one of the ones we've been able to identify. 
they all, I guess these were one room schools um, that these kids all went in at that time. Some of them, they're all from all over. And yeah, and they probably, a lot of them probably related to, believe uh -huh. me. Uh-huh, mm-hmm, yep. Any more questions or comments from the chat, Karen? Uh, no, not at this time. Uh, wait, uh, Drain T just said, looks like you're related to my husband. Um, <laughs> it, it also says those, those are the same drains, the ones from Maryland, but they spread out and they, ask, yeah, that's what happened um, in a lot of cases mm -hmm. with the uh, families on the uh, uh, East Coast, um, you know, and, uh, you know, they were giving the, these families land as the, the West was opened up after they moved uh, uh, Native Americans off of the land. They were giving these families lands. So a lot of the males, they would take their families and spread out into different directions where they could get access to this, this land. And so, uh, so it looks like um, our drains, Connie, are related. Yes, that's, <laughs> we are definitely, yes, because Carlos is, is third cousin to my mom. <laughs> Yes, uh, indeed. Oh, my God. Um, I noticed somebody said up here, they said they typed in Edgefield and their ancestry, and they pulled up a lot of other, um, they, they found out that there was a lot of people who were connected to them. The thing is, is that because my mom's DNA goes back all the way to the beginning of that area, because Edgefield was founded in 1785, but um, the whole area was actually started as the 96th district and the 96th district was started in 1769, same year that Moses was born. And my mom is a descendant of the five founding families of that area. So because she's a descendant of the five founding families of that area, she is actually related to anybody mm. who's from there. So if whoever pulled, whoever said that, if you have a JY or if you have Yeldell that pops up, that's probably, it could be my mother. Or it could be, if you're matching Settles or, or Holloways or Yeldells or Williams, you're, you're going to end up being related to, to us as well because my mom literally matches everybody in Edgefield. And Nikita. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, Nikita also asked, how, how can you find more information on a Williams male when there are no, when there's no more information? Can you something uh, more specific if it's too uh, general? Uh, and Nikita, uh, I'm, a, I'm gonna assume you're talking about in that Edgefield uh, uh, community. Um, hopefully you're, you're uh, uh, narrowing it down to that Edgefield community because of course, uh, looking for a Williams mail could be very difficult, period. Yeah, uh, there's always information. Wait for the 1950s coming. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it just, the, just the census record alone, sometimes you might run out of space. It might be some time that you have to wait for something else to come, but that 1950 census is coming. I mean, like I always tell Brian and, and and the rest of our team that we work with, I'm not researching right now. And I was telling Antoinette that while we were waiting, I'm, I'm like, I'm not researching, I'm cleaning my tree. And even though I'm always putting something else extra up there, I'm doing it because the 1950 census is coming and that's gonna start a whole new can of worms. So it's never, it never ends. Antoinette and I both just were sitting there saying that it never ends. And, and it's gonna be something there. I mean, if you haven't looked at your 1870 census and found out who that white line is on that 1870 census to see if you're connected to that person to find out if that person could possibly be your slave owner, that's another move you could make, you know, to figure out. There, there, are, there are things that you can definitely do. Um, 1860 census, uh, the slave schedule census and the census to see the persons dealt with that surname. Right. I always tell people to do the surname research and of the founding people who organized that county or that parish and who's the founding family. Yes, do uh, some research on the area that your family is from, on the area itself. Don't give up on it. It's, it's not like it's, 
nothing that you can do. Listen, if you're from Edgefield, you have it. This is a book that was written and it, it lists inside. There are 15,000 15, enslaved people listed in this book. Wow. And it's giving you the slave owner, the own, who the owner is, a description of the slave, his, the person's name, what they were sold for. I mean, it's it's an amazing, an amazing book that was written by Gloria Lu, Lu, Gloria Ramsey Lucas. And it's, it's a purchase that can go online and purchase that book. They, it's it's available on Ancestry. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's available on Ancestry. I don't think it's purchasable anymore. I'm not sure. They can contact the Tompkins Library and see, but I'm not sure if it's purchasable. But it's available on Ancestry. And and it may be available in the library too. So in yeah. the genealogy department of the library in that county, you and, and I do want to say this to everyone whose family members was enslaved. There's no way that you can do your genealogy research without researching the person who owns your family with the same last name. You must follow their children because sometimes your ancestors could have been given away as a present mm -hmm. for a wedding or when the family moved to another location, your ancestor went with them. So certainly when you see that surname, you certainly, and you know the area, go to the library and look in the founding families of that area and yeah. track them down. Because one of the things I found when the Harrells came from Dalton, South Carolina in 1803, they actually uh, came almost like in a, it, 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 it was like a wagon mule train, I mean, a wagon train. Can you imagine, you, you know, like when you watch the cowboys and you see people uh, coming together and there's these families traveling out west, you know, uh, and no, they didn't know everybody, but they joined that, that wagon train to travel. And then some people just took up homesteads in the place where they were, you know, so you really have to follow that trail. And I'm going to say this to you. You got to get that hound dog scent. Once mm -hmm. you get that scent, you know, you, gotta, you know, and, and it's real. Let me tell you something. That's a real, in anybody that's a genealogist or his family historian, they can tell you it's a spiritual journey. That ancestor will disturb, disturb, will disturb your spirit until you get up and you do something, they will not go away. So that's three. So I tell people, I live in the past, the present and the future. And, and when we're researching the past, we live more among those that is dead, researching and learning about them and you know, calling their names and trying to uh, do what we can to give some dignity to their life, that hard life that they had, and, and to write their names in the history book because those are our ancestors. Mm -hmm. No one is going to do that for us. Mm -hmm. It's your journey. Everybody on here is your journey. I had a follow on to that, Antoinette, and I actually have a very good graphic to go with, to go with it. I promise I'm not going to take up too much time. So to research Moses, that involved researching him in Virginia where he was born, North Carolina where he was taken first, and then South Carolina where he lived the latter part of his life. Um, an amazing team of five people working on this. There's me, there's Donia, there's our cousins, both black and white, Sharon Rowe, Hamad As uh, Asad Settles, and Loretta Bellamy. We have gone through 23 different archives online Donnie has done research in, in Edgefield. We've read books, newspaper clippings, gone through deeds, and I've got this queued up. So this is to give you an example of how we started. So I was finding deeds in various North Carolina archives where um, Moses had been enslaved, and I started writing them down on paper for the team. After it got to 25 pages, I realized it wasn't gonna be feasible, but this gives you a working idea. So this is actually Moses Williams Sr.'s father, who was also his enslaver, Daniel Williams II. So to let everyone know kind of what generation of the William enslaving Williams family Daniel fell in, he's the third generation, so that's why you see that up there. 
Mm-hmm. And then these are all the deeds that he, these are just some of the deeds that he did. They're all dated with the location where the deed was raised. Not all of these were enacted. A lot of these seem to be provisional deeds. The wonderful thing about the Williams family, if there is a wonderful thing about enslavement, is they actually put the ages of their enslaved people. So we have the date that the deed was done and an age. So we have the rough year of birth, which made this process so much easier. But Moses is in here. Some of his siblings are in here because we found them in the 1870 census and they're Williams and we found their, um, their DNA matches with their descendants. And our three times great grandfather Moses Jr. is all the way down there. Wow. Kind of a thing. Oh no, actually that is Moses. Sorry. That's Moses. That's Moses the elder. I just looked at that, 1922. So this is how we started. It made kind of sense to me, but when papers started turning into like 25 pages, decided to create a project tree on ancestry. We used a methodology called the Beyond Kin methodology, which people can Google to find out about the Beyond Kin project. And basically you have an enslaver, you add all of the deeds, all of the probate records, and then all of the enslaved, you list all of the enslaved people. And that way you can start tracking them from generation to generation. But that's literally how, that that was how we started. Mm-hmm. And see when it said, if you notice where it had the 22 beside it, that's why we know exactly when he was born because of the fact that they put age. Yeah. And, and then the other Moses that you saw up there, that was, that was the other, Mo- that was the original Moses that mm-hmm. he thought was him. That was Moses Jr. Uh-huh. But that was the first Moses. And we already knew about that one. And wow. we ended up finding all of this other stuff. And it was just an amazing, it was a, one of probably one of our most amazing finds until we ended up finding this hate good. That one was, that was the next, that, that was probably the second most amazing find because Miss Hager was by what was Miss Hager by accident? Did we kind of that was DNA. That was DNA. That was DNA, right. That was DNA. Yeah, that was DNA. But that was probably those two things that those were um yeah I mean Moses is an is an extraordinary find and we do hope to have somebody talk about his life because if anybody if anybody deserves to be in the history book it is him. The man saw everything. They thought of him enough to put him in a paper. Let's just be there. Let's think about that. White people thought of him enough to and put him in a paper. And well, South Carolina, because he was 115. That's right. He was South Car- possibly in 1884 when he died, South Carolina's last living link to the American Revolution. Yeah. Yeah. They thought enough of him. Yeah. And, and I'm so happy to hear you say that, you know, put the story out there, somebody, somebody, you never know, somebody is going to reach out to you because it's such a great story. And here's a man, you know, it's just unheard of, first of all, and to know that <clears throat> you all have gathered that much material. Connie went off air, but I really wanted to ask Connie <clears throat> if she, what was the most amazing thing that she found? When she come back in. What was the most amazing thing that you found, Brian, until we get Connie back on? Uh, with regarding to Moses, well, actually, um, actually, probably finding more of his children than I thought we would actually be able to find. If mm-hmm. anyone told me that we would even be able to find 10 of 45 kids. I would have thought mm, that's going to be tough going. Because we have all five boys, right? Mm-hmm. We have well, all, yeah, we have all five boys. We have all five boys. So out of the tw- that 27, we have all five boys. So that means we have 22 girls. Yeah. You know, and it's just amazing. Yeah. And Connie, what was the most amazing record that you found or thing that you found in your research? Oh, um, I have been looking for um, my mother's grandmother. We were told that she died um, from getting gored by a bull at one point or something like that. But just 
within the last two weeks, they sent me her death record only to find out she is buried between what they call Boyle and Cleveland, Mississippi. And to find out what she really died from, that's what opened my eyes. Mm -hmm. Was it what the oral history that had been passed down, was it different than that? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. She actually died, uh, she hemorrhaged from the birth of a child. And okay. she wow. died on Valentine's Day of all days. So that, that really got me because she died on Valentine's Day. Yeah, wow. And we don't even know where the baby is, if the baby lived or not. Oh, you don't know. Wow. Karen, any questions or comments coming from the chat? Uh, not from yeah. the chat, but I have a question about uh, Ms. Haygood. Mm -hmm. uh, are you, you, is it H-A-Y-G-O-O-D? It's all of that. It's, uh, well, the, <laughs> I think the, the correct spelling is H-A-G-O-O-D. But, but it's, it's, both, it's that one too. But it's, yeah, H-A-Y, H-A-E. Oh, I've got, actually, I've got another surprise um, that shocked Donnie and I. Mo the women who are descended from Moses have kids like clockwork. Yep. Every mm -hmm. 18 months to two years. And that continues to this day. This day. So I can, and I, I can tell y'all, okay, so I, I don't, I don't handle cut cards with me. I never do. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm my mom. I, I was able to have children. I have four children and I miscarried twice. So I would have had six. And I didn't understand why I was able to have children because I was on the pill. And I'm looking at my doctor like, I'm, 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 I have a problem here, sir. I'm holding up these pill packs. These and, don't work. <laughs> yeah, like this, is, this is an issue. Why am I holding up this pill pack here and this is not working? What is the problem? So he was kind of confused too. He was like, I don't understand why this isn't, you know, what is the problem? So he took me off the pill and he started to test me. And in doing that, I ended up with my, my last child, my baby. And, um, he told me, he said, I need you to go and talk to somebody in your family and I want you to find out if there is a pattern in your people having babies. Sure enough, there was a pattern. And that pattern was every 18 months to two years. My mother, from the oldest to the youngest, my uncle, his name is Thomas Yeldale. He was born in 1914. And from 1914 to 1939, my grandmother was having children every 18 months to two years. Wow. I had her DNA. I literally had it. And I'm looking at him like, sir, how can we stop this? Because I'm, I'm not that one. So <laughs> he had to fix that his situation. And um, uh, he, but, you know, he, asked, he actually explained that to me that, that's what it was. He said, it is a gene in your family that happens. And so then Brian started, because Brian is the DNA person in our group. And he does, I, I don't like science. So we were doing it and he was pointing it out and he said, it's, it's, it's happening again. And I'm like, what's happening? And he showed it to me and I was like, well, dang, it, it went all the way through. It went all the way back there. So now we know that that breeding that whole breeding line, it, it, it came all the way back from him. Not to mention the fact, the age thing, because Moses looked, he looked 50, but he was 65. Well, I'm 50. Do you know how many people look at me? Well, I'm almost 50. And people look at me and they're like, no, you, no you're not. I'm still mistaken for in my 20s, late 20s now. So that's that's there's a gene of preserving the the uh, slowing down of the aging aging yeah so that's 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 wow wow kind yeah. of what gene that you find is in your family and that trait that is passed down from one generation to the other without people really knowing you know this happened every generation we have something and I'm trying to. Uh, Ichnia doses or something like that is called. The women are the carriers, I guess, so to speak, but it breaks out on the men. 
and they have to wear long sleeves in the summertime because their skin looks like scarily like alligator skin almost. Oh, wow. So if it never manifests on the women, but the men, all the men from that, that line, it breaks out on them. And it, it's a scaly type of skin and they can't wear, they have to wear long pants. They have to wear long shirts and you can actually see it. And it's kind of weird, but it's only in the men, but the women are the carrier. We, we, I don't, I don't get that. <laughs> Wow. wow. That's, that's much amazing. We're learning so much and it's, and all of you all have just really fascinating history and, you know, and, and we can't thank you all enough for sharing it with us because Nurturing Our Roots is designed to hear the stories from the everyday people with extraordinary stories. And each one of you have extraordinary histories that is worth sharing, you know, when I think about the family history, uh, there's going to be people in the family, and I know all of you knew, know this already, who will welcome you with loving arms and open arms. And there's some people who say, why bother? You know, it may not even be bothered. It's worth the work to them. But I would like to say that as we approach Juneteenth, and when I think about Juneteenth, I think about, you know, all of the freedom, the freedom for our ancestors and what that meant and I am proud of each one of you that you are holding them and their story, their legacies, their triumphs in high esteem. It is your story. Uh, you didn't choose this, it chose you. And your ancestors could have chose anyone in the family, but they know it wasn't going to mean anything to anyone in the family. And what I believe, and I know this to be the truth, the DNA, is there, it cannot, it, it, it will not be destroyed as long as there's another child that comes in that family lineage. But it is very important that you continue your research, your groundbreaking research. Uh, congratulations on your books. Congratulations on sharing it because that's what it's all about. Just simply doing what you do and planting those seeds. And when you plant those seeds, when you start to water those seeds, you don't know what's going to pop up. But believe me, it may be 20 years from now, but there's going to be someone that come behind us. And maybe that person is here and maybe that person is, is not here yet. But whatever you do, just know that you're, you're leaving a blueprint for that person, footprints. They're gonna be so happy to find all this amazing research. Uh, it, and I would like to suggest something too. Make sure that the local libraries in that area of Edgefield, as well as the university, have some of your research available in their uh, library in the library as well as the university, so that you can start to create that paper trail from for Moses. You know, it's just dynamic to do it. Karen, any suggestions? Um, not necessarily a suggestion, but. Um... Uh, I know that I have just loads of uh, Edgefield DNA matches on my maternal side. What would someone do if they want to find out if they are in any way connected to the Moses Williams uh, history? If you've taken a DNA test, and Donna, you, you can prompt me for more names, there are a clutch of DNA match names you should look out for. I'm one. Donnie is another one. Um, her mom, Hamad. One. Hamad is another one. Uh, Sheila, Sheila Hightower mm -hmm. is another name. Um, Travis Gordon is another one. Um, Jay Yeldale, JY, that's my mother. Uh, she's she's one to look out for. The other thing that I suggest is that if you're on Jet Match, if you do the one to many, I mean, where you do the the one to two, where you can see if if it's a shared, I think that's what. Yeah, mm -hmm. when just contact me or Brian and um, use our one of our kits and see who is a shared person. Because I'm telling you if, you, if you share anybody with my mother, then you, you are literally related to my mom. That 
that is just without a doubt. My mom's own parents are related to each other. They it's that bad. So we could definitely, I'll share my mom's kit with you. And um, I even have some of Sheila's information too, because it got so bad that half of Edgefield was related to Sheila and the other half was related to my mother. That, that's just how it was. And if you was related to both of them, then you was related to all of Edgefield. Jean, your aunt, that's another person. Brian. Yes. Yeah, Jean. Jean. So that's another name, Jean Jones. That's another name to look out for. But check, you. Well, I'll share my mom's kit with you and um, see, see who you guys share. And if you share anybody, then you're definitely related to my mother. Because my mom, my mom literally goes back to the to the founding, to the 96th district. And the other thing is there's a genealogy adventures tree that's on ancestry. It's a public tree. And all of those families, they're all up there. And that's both that's the cool. white, that's both the white side of her family and the black side of the family. Brian, how many public trees have you found? For Moses Williams family, have you found many at all? I, to be honest, I don't look at other people's trees. Mm -mm. I, don't, I don't do it. We we refuse to do that. I've just seen, it, it, it does nothing but confuse us. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I've, just, I've just seen too many trees that are wrong. So yeah, I just I don't look at them anymore. Yeah, and we don't even suggest people to like even when you're looking at our tree, don't copy it. Because it, it, a change can happen in it. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. even, yeah. And, and we're very thorough. We are, we are extremely thorough in our trees, but we, we still say, don't copy it. Mm. Do, but, do the work yourself, do, do your own work. And if you find something that's different or, 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 or just not, and doesn't look right, let us know and we'll go through it and we'll look at it. But if it don't show, we ain't, we we won't you know we won't change. But if it shows up that you're seeing, you're showing us something different than what we have, then we'll change it. We'll we'll make that change. Like oh, okay, I see where you're coming from. We don't we don't copy. I don't even. I just hit ignore when it shows ancestry family trees. I don't even look at them because I'm. <laughs> but because we practice what we preach against every person that's in our tree are all the documents that we have for them. That's right. All the sources and citations, all, you know, best, you know, what, what they call best genealogical practice, the, you know, genealogical standards of proof. They're all up there. Yeah. I just Go posted ahead. about this yesterday in our Descendants of Jesuit Enslavement group, because there's people who have been copying the same mistakes over and over again, and now Ancestry is showing them as hints that mm -hmm. other people are taking them to be real when it's absolutely flat out false wrong information. And I said, please don't copy. I mean, you can, if you wanna look at the tree and you compare that to some of your DNA matches, it, maybe it could be a guide to lead you in a certain direction, but pull up those source documents that document from one generation back to the next generation, do not copy trees we had to get people to to drop certain names to find miss haygood didn't we we did we, we did. had to get people to drop that that was following us we had to get them to drop certain names so that we can actually con that, that we could confirm that miss haygood was moses's wife and that's how that because through lines was was doing that they were doing exactly what you were talking about and once we got that straight because for whatever reason they were making moses parents both of them white that's impossible you can't have two white people make a, a mulatto child <laughs> it is this not that's not a possible thing and when they were doing that we were like could y'all please remove that please you know we were sending messages oh could you please remove that this man is a black man did they remove it yeah and we were you know we got to the point where we were able to find what we needed to find but yeah people were doing those those things and because they did that you know 
my mom's DNA, like I said, my mom's DNA goes back to all of those different people in all of those different ways, but you can't, you can't copy somebody else's tree or somebody else's information because one wrong thing will throw you in a whole nother direction. Or the other kind. Um, I, I try to, sorry, I try to make sure when I am researching that that person is definitely, I, I go all through all the extremes with checking that name, checking that date, checking that color. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to make sure I do not sign on to somebody that's wrong because like you said, people will follow that and mm -hmm. you can't have somebody following the wrong thing and it's, it's just not happening. You've got to have that definite proof and that's why I don't stop until I make sure everything is correct. I'm doing, I, I'll drive in a hole, go look for that right thing to make mm -hmm. sure it's correct. Or you know, what I do, if I'm not entirely sure is I will mark and you can't not see it. it. Says this has to be confirmed, and people still copy it. Yeah. Well, so I'm say as as a researcher, I'm being transparent and honest, saying I think I'm about sixty or fifty percent sure that this is correct, but this needs to be confirmed, and people still still download it. But the other problem that we were having is because Moses had two wives. Mariah Stallworth, who was his second wife, was much younger than he was yes so we were seeing she was born about 1820 1825 and we're seeing kids that were born 1830 attached to her right and, but she couldn't possibly be that child's yeah. mother it was miss haygood who was their mother right how much younger was she from moses oh i think she was a good 20 to 25 years what? younger. 1769 he was 1769 she was 18 25, what is that? Let me do a yeah. quick math. Yeah, that's a big difference. Yeah. She was, she was young enough to be his daughter. Actually, she was younger than his oldest kids. Wow. Because <laughs> remember, Donnie, she and Jane could Jane Williams could have almost been sisters. Yeah, because Jane was 18. So that was and Jane was a granddaughter. Because mm -hmm. Jane, so Jane is my so Jane is my um my mom's great grandmother. And she was born in 1835, 1835, 1837. And um, Mariah was born around 1825. Mm -hmm. Moses was born 1769. So that's 50 years. That's a 56, 56 year difference. Because I just added it. Yeah. Ooh. yeah. And he was still having children. He was having children with her. And these were, and the thing is, is that <clears throat> the kids that we have found that belong to Mariah, we know that these are his children because they match my mom. We've confirmed confirmed them DNA. So he really did have 45 kids. Mm -hmm. You know, we, re we really are finding this. The one thing that Brian and I are really trying to find is the fact that how that particular, um, that last, that last uh, article that he put up that was from the Medical Anomaly book that stated that it was all authenticated. He was researched. Yes. He was already researched. Yes. We're trying to find the research that they did. And if we could find the research that they did on him, that would be awesome. You're going to find some. And I like that, that. I like the fact that Moses knew all of his children. That reminds me of my great uh, grandfather, Alexander. Uh, Karen and I, we share the same great and great, great grandfather. Well, nevertheless, he was married to our grandmother, Emma Mead Harrell. But um, there was a woman that he had an affair with and the woman had children for him. And uh, secretly, the family knew about the family, but there was no relationship there. They knew of them but there was no relationship. And, and I just find that so disappointing because although things happen, but that still was family. You, you know, you just can't, you just can't erase people off the scene because you don't agree to what happened. You, you mm -hmm. know, uh, because that is family. That's, mm -hmm. that was Alexander's children. And so all those years, um, in the cemetery, there was a woman 
buried in the cemetery named Corrine. And she was buried not that far from Alexander, his mother, uh, I mean, his wife, Emma, and his other children. And I said, who is this woman? And come to find out this woman was his daughter. So um, I do have contact with, I mean, I, I'm friends on Facebook with some of the woman's children, but that's family, you know. Um, with genealogy, we're not here to judge anybody's life or to, you know, shame anybody. We're just here to claim all our family, you know, that's what we want to do because it's important. You know, you look at someone every day and, you know, you know, that's your sister, you know, that's your brother, but you better not say nothing. That's like a, I, I, I wouldn't want to put a child through that, you know. You know, I, I did something like that, Antoinette. I was at a funeral. My, my uncle had passed away and my, my grandfather and his brother, they were known to the women in town. So this, this guy walks in and I nudge my cousin. I said, hey, is that another one of y'all? She said, no, nah, fool, that's your mother's brother. And I almost went under the pew because I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I almost went under the pew. They, they did. That they, they were known, these men were known every time a woman came and knocked at the door. Well, one came and knocked at the wrong door, say, Oh, I meant to go get the other lady. This is his baby. So, you, you, it happened. <laughs> it happened. Yeah. yeah. Before closing, I want to tell you all about a story. And this happened, it was all over the, the news. This woman had no idea that the man that she was married to and had children with was her father. Oh, and her I mother was, you remember reading something like that? I think I think I did. Uh -huh. Well, anyway, her mother was sort of like a, a, a busy woman, you know, and she kind of felt that somebody in the family sort of knew that this man was her father, but they didn't say anything. So after her husband died, her husband, father, father, husband died, she saw a hairbrush and she decided to take that DNA, take that a strand of hair and have a DNA analysis on it and come to find out that the man who she was married to, the man that she had children with was her father and her husband. So mm. in all reality, the children was his grandchildren and his children. It, something like that could, I was like, how is she maintaining sanity? You know, and how could you forgive a family member who knows that's a possibility that person is your father and mm. do, don't say anything? You know, listen, I, Brian and I, there were times we have one researcher that we get on the phone with on the weekends, and we just, we, when we need to hammer out a certain part of our family. Loretta Bellamy, God, I, we love her to death. Don't tell her I said that. But, you know, we love her to death. And um, we will get on the phone with Loretta because we have to, this, this is so confusing. Mm -hmm. And there was this one group. It was the Harrisons, the Freemans, the Mackeys, and the Talberts. All because this one particular lady, Eula Talbot, was just being so sweet and being everybody's mama. And because she was being everybody's mama, we had to figure out which way the children were going. So you had two siblings marrying two siblings from somewhere else, you know, brothers and sisters marrying other brothers and sisters on another family and, and everybody. I got so angry that I went on a family page that we have. And I said, listen, when we get this done, stop marrying each other. Y'all need to cut this action out. This is utterly ridiculous. You need to know who you are. I'm tired of doing this. I'm tired of separating y'all. And th that's that. Stop marrying each other. Because it was over. It was, it was like over the top. They kept marrying each other. It was over and over and over again. And somebody knew. You knew somebody knew, but they just wasn't telling them. And it was just, it was just the most amazing mess. It was the most 
amazing mess that you could ever come across that we got sick. It took us an entire weekend and all three of us came out of that weekend with extremely bad headaches. Yeah. Because yeah. it's that bad. But part of it is such a mess yeah. is because you were married twice or three times. All of her husbands had had previous wives. They had all had had kids. Yeah. Previous wives. So you was being mentioned as a mom and all in just like 20 or 30 different obituaries. Right. And she wasn't the mother of any of them. And she wasn't the mother of any of them. <sighs> <laughs> she wasn't a mother of any of them. And so we had to decipher. So that's when newspapers and obituaries come in and we're sitting there and just pulling all these people and pulling these children apart and saying, okay, this person goes here and this person goes there. And then in the midst of doing that, you pulling in more families and taking away this family. It was the, it was, it was the biggest mess that I literally went on that page and I told everybody, stop. Just stop. Ask somebody first before you go that route. Call us. We know. Ask us. Because it was, was crazy. There, was there any of your older relatives that were telling them, hey, you're related to this person? Don't there mm. was nobody talking? Nope. <laughs> I'm telling you, the secret, the American Secret Service missed the boat. Because if any people in this country can keep a secret, it's black folk. Most Secret definitely. Service should have been recruiting us all the way back in the day. All the way back. Mm. Taking it all the way back, Be, especially the ones in Edgefield. Well, they'll take it to the grave with them. So, you know, but it's just like that story I was telling you. Um, and, and I think that uh, they do it because they don't want the shame to be bought on them. You know, look, they was people and young people and you know, they had lives themselves. And so that's why in genealogy, we don't judge. So in our closing, uh, we would like to take, start off with Connie, Brian, and uh, Danya to really just give us just one closing statement that you all would like to give to us before I turn it over to Karen. Well, I like to thank you ladies for doing the research that you've done so far. Um, your research has helped me and it's helped me in more ways than one. And when you go back to Kosciuszko and go in that courthouse again, I need you to look something up for me <laughs> because okay. it's, it's terrible trying to get Mississippi records. Mississippi was no good with records and you got the niche. So I got to give it to Some of them is an attic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will keep that in mind. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to say Approach genealogy for this is one for drivers. We all hate traffic jams. We all hate rush hour. Approach genealogy, especially like a brick wall ancestor. You can either decide to sit in traffic for the next hour or work out back roads and back routes. And well, if I you know get here and, and do this, I'm going to still get to the same place. It's going to take me a little bit longer, but I'm going to get there. Think about genealogy like that. Awesome. And um, I'm going to thank you ladies as well for inviting us onto the show and sharing the story of Moses. Um, he is probably one of our most fascinating stories. Um, but as far as uh, thinking of genealogy, I, I like math. And I think of genealogy as math. I think of it like ge geometry. Because in geometry, you always have to prove whether an angle how an angle is. You have that proof and you have that hypothesis and then you have to prove that hypothesis right or wrong. And that's the same thing with genealogy. You have that oral history. Well, that's that hypothesis. You know, that oral history is the hypothesis and the proof is the actual story. That's the angle. And you have to prove it whether it's right or wrong. And if you look at it like that, you got to make sure. So Oral history isn't always the truth. Understand that, know that. It's not always the truth. I know you want to be believe grandmommy all the time and you want to go, <laughs> yeah, you, you want to believe them. You want to say grandma is right, but understand that grandma might be keeping something from you that she not want you to know. So she's going to tell you what she want you to know as opposed to what you really need to hear. 
you have to prove what she's saying. Yeah. And if it's wrong, you have to have the heart to say, yeah, that wasn't right. And your family gonna be mad about it, but you have to have the heart. It's a reason why you were chosen to do this because they felt like you were bold enough to be able and brave enough to be able to approach them and say, you're wrong, that's not true. And that's why you're chosen to do it because they believe that you are not gonna back down. So don't back down. You are a confirmation to me right now. And I wanna thank you for that because I'm dealing with something that pertains to Karen and I with business. And I feel like, like not all my family because some family understand it's right. But when you go up against people who you was taught, this is that person, that person. And so thank you for that confirmation. And I know that grandmother Emma chose me because once again, I believe in doing it right. I believe in acknowledging all heirs. I believe in whatever. I don't care if it's just a, a loaf of bread. If she said, I want my heirs to have this loaf of bread, then we divide that bread the way equally. And then that way, consciously, when you go to sleep at night, you feel good and you honored what she or what your ancestor. And so you're right. They chose you because you will stand firm with it. Mm -hmm. uh, Bonnie confirmed this was something else that was a confirmation when she thought her grandmother died from something and come to find out she died from him. You see, but the Ori history had been told over and over and over and over and over. So I just want to thank all of you. I want to thank you, Connie, Brian, Donia. You all have been just outstanding guests and we learned so much from you all, not only sharing your story, but your genealogy tips. We certainly appreciate that because we are not, we don't claim to know everything. We're learning too. We all walk in this journey together because uh, we have to walk it together. And so I just want to thank you all for being a guest here on Nurture Our Roots. Karen? Yes, and I also would like to thank all of you as well. And thank you to everyone in the live chat. You can continue uh, the conversation from the live chat in the comments if you have some additional questions. Uh, I know that Danya and Brian are on all matter of social media. How about you, Connie? Are you on social media? I am, and um, I have my own page, Connie Green, on Facebook. And then we have one for the little family on Facebook. Um, we, uh, we, we're all over the place, so. And get with Tracy Drain when you, that drain that, that you commented with, get with her. <laughs> okay. But well, thank you, everyone. Go ahead, Antoinette. All right. Should I do it, Karen? You should do it, Antoinette. Thank you for joining us on Nurturing Our Roots. Please give us a big thumbs up and subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so that you won't miss any of our videos. And before closing, I would like to say if anybody else have a story that they would like to share, please get in contact with us at nurtureinourroots at gmail.com. And that's how Connie found us. And, and so thank you all. Uh, we learned a lot from you. And thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>